This is the Dreadful Podcast from TV Podcast Industries, and we're watching Penny Dreadful City of Angels, Episode 4, Yosefina and the Holy Spirit. You know, Elsa, my husband, your friend, Dr. Kraft, he's not who he pretends to be, dear. Ask him about Essen. Ask about his family. Shh, 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 shh. Just between us girls. Before you start measuring the drapes, find out who he really is. You know, just between us girls. My dear, I will not let you turn me into anything so banal as the rejected wife. Welcome back, fellow Penny Faithful. This is TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Penny Dreadful City of Angels, Episode 4, Yosefina and the Holy Spirit. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hi, D. Hi, Do. Hi, Da, fellow Dreadfuls <laughs> and Dreaders. Uh, welcome. Yes, I am one of your other hosts, John. And rounding out the trifecta, not the true trifecta, the trifecta. <laughs> no. <laughs> I am Chris. <laughs> still hasn't stopped. We're four episodes in, and we still haven't gotten Chris to, uh, to stop his impersonations of a German accent. Uh, nine, nine, nine. <laughs> well, we are certainly going to have the uh, alignment of the stars and the broken crystal um, as uh, Chris does a rendition of the German beer hall song in both his best German accent <laughs> along with his best singing. Um, so it will be... Dreadful. It will it, 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 it will uh, fit with the dreadful podcast mm-hmm. really, really nicely. And fellow Penny Faithful, if you don't hear Chris's version, it's because I probably edited it out. <laughs> because it was too racist. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Uh, I am probably not going to be doing it. I would love to, but I'm afraid all the crystal wear in every house of our listeners would break. Mm-hmm. Not because of the vocal cords and the sound waves, the frequency that I sing at. No, just you would be basically breaking it to try and gouge out your ears <laughs> uh, because of the sound. Ooh, gruesome, gruesome. <laughs> well, welcome back, everybody. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast again, just imagine that you can subscribe over on tvpodcastindustries.com uh, to subscribe to our, our feed for all of our podcasts and all the things we've been covering. Uh, one thing to mention, we know that not all of our listeners are watching Penny Dread uh, City of Angels at the moment so we have gone out to our Patreon group and we have said that we are going to cover a movie uh, over there and go, go back to the movies we were supposed to be going to watch um, Marvel's Black Widow this month um, and unfortunately obviously it has been pushed back so we are going to do a movie we gave some options to our Patreons we said we cover one of four films and gave them the choice we had the options of Joker, Wonder Woman, Captain America, Winter Soldier or Iron Man 2 Iron Man 2. I know. I was trying to think of ones that had Black Widow in them, and that's her first introduction that's to the Marvel true. Universe. That is so true. I thought that, that was it. You are right with your reaction, though. We got zero votes for uh, <laughs> for Iron Man 2, so we won't know, be covering but that. It was, it's so cheesily good. Justin Hammer, Whiplash, the, the Formula One section... Mm-hmm. In Monica, come on, it had some classic moments. I think it 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 paled in mo- in comparison to most other MCU movies because it was setting up other films rather than being a great film in itself at the time. But I think yeah. looking back on it, it probably will be quite good. Yeah, maybe. I I think controversially, I am a big Iron Man three. Oh, that's fan. A much better film, definitely. Much oh yeah, film. Shane Black. It's still yeah, exactly. Like kiss, kiss, bang, bang, yeah. all the way down to Iron Man. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I still like Iron Man too. Yeah. I know, I know, I know it's not controversial. It's still not like Thor the Dark World level, no. but it's, it's good. <laughs> it's up there. It's yeah. RDJ. As well. But we will get there at some stage, but yes. On the request of our patrons, we're not going to be covering that. No, <laughs> uh, <so it> did... <laughs> no one else wants to see <laughs> Exactly. It did come out as a, as a joint, uh, a joint vote though so uh the two films that our patrons have chosen for us to do are captain america winter soldier and uh, wonder woman uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do captain america winter soldier first 
We're going to release that within the next month over on our Patreon. For our patrons, you can go over there to patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries. Contribute any amount, you'll get access to that podcast. And then we're going to do the Wonder Woman review or look back before Wonder Woman gets released, the second uh, Wonder Woman movie. Yes, right? Wonder Woman 1984. 1984. Yes, 1984. I, I saw yeah. a few bits and bobs there. I don't know why we didn't do Wonder Woman to begin with, because uh, it was a film I came out really buzzing about. I really mm-hmm. enjoyed it. Same with The the Joker, which was one of the other films. Yep. Um, so, yes, we're, we've got a few little things. Uh, obviously, with the relatively blank uh, Marvel slate um, at the moment for mm-hmm. TV, uh, that we will sort of go and do some of those movies that we haven't been able to or we didn't get round to doing at the time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes, and of course, obviously... By supporting us at any value, you're helping keep the lights on, keeping the servers going, and just keeping our mics warm. Mm -hmm. So, And, of course, any and all appreciation for any amount, but also you can just share our podcast, leave a like, uh, subscribe, and or just leave us a review, uh, because sharing the podcast is sharing the love if you cannot support us financially. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you can also email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com if you have any thoughts or any requests for things that we may cover uh, in the future, at least movies anyway. We have a few TV shows that we'll be covering, definitely, but uh, one-off movies. Sure, why not? Pop us in an email. Yeah, it's not like we're doing anything else. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And of course, with that email, feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com, don't forget about our dreadful pub quiz and the pub quiz questions at the end of each episode of Penny Dreadful City of Angels. We take a trip to the Crimson Cat on many a time. And dare I say it, the winking Crimson Cat. Mm-hmm. It winked uh, in, in this episode, which was quite nice. Uh, I had to do a double take. But we do go to the Crimson Cat for our pub quiz question uh, to ask a question about that episode. Uh, so you can send in your answers each week or all together in one batch uh, at the end of the series to the feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. And of course, one lucky dreadful listener will get some penny dreadful goodies. And while I'm on that note, the penny dreadful city of angel store is now open on showtime.com forward slash store. Mm-hmm. Yes. So we will be, um, trawling that to see what, uh, drinking goodies we will pick out for the, uh, lucky winner uh, of the dreadful pub quiz. Mm. Uh, dare I say it, it could be a life size version of a very drunk Linda Craft, for example. <laughs> uh, who knows? <laughs> she was certainly enjoying the drinks to get her through her son's birthday party yes. for sure yeah it definitely um, was I, I went down to the store actually during the week this week just to check it out and make sure uh, and yes they are totally playing up to uh, the type of stuff we would normally give away in our goodie bags for uh, for our our pub quiz and um, there's some uh, crimson cat pint glasses there's a hip flask on there there's shot glasses there's a uh, wine glasses on there you know loads of stuff uh, drink related so uh so pretty much aimed directly at us maybe they were listening <laughs> maybe just maybe <laughs> let's get into the episode itself guys ready to go guys yeah yeah <laughs> this episode was directed once again by sergio mimica gazan who directed episode three and written by john logan uh for this episode john do you want to tell us what they gave us with the big summary for this episode sure Detective Tiago Vega scours Sister Molly's beach house for clues, leading to some disquieting revelations. Meanwhile, Councilwoman Beck proposes an alternate route for the Ario Seco motorway, infuriating her rival Councilman Townsend and leading him back to his unchecked appetites. Meanwhile, Peter Kraft invites Elsa and her pseudo-son Frank to a party at his home, inflaming the suspicions of his wife Linda and disquieting even further uh, her son, Tom. Detective Lewis Michener asks the gangster, Benny Berman, to help battle the growing Nazi menace in L.A. Meanwhile, after Josefina Vega has a harrowing encounter with Officer Riley, Matteo seeks retribution with his new Pachuco friends as Josefina pursues spiritual enlightenment with Sister Molly. Here's an episode, episode four of this show, where so much is ramping up, so much is going on that I don't know whether we're going to get it all covered in our podcast, guys. No, it was definitely, <laughs> they're starting to throw everything bar the kitchen sink in here. <laughs> um, but we'll wait and see. We'll, we'll, hope, we'll, we'll do our best to cover it all. Absolutely. John, do you want to take us off with your big moment for the episode? I will, yes. Um, it is the unholy trinity. 
bad Batman, bad Superman, and bad Wonder Woman. No, not in this case. Oh. Or should I say the unholy spirits of Josefina, Officer Riley, and Matteo? Um, yes, this is something that is just massive it's really huge for for this episode because it's been building for so long uh you know we've had the repulsion of officer riley um really just the inherent bias you know uh, and and racism that he has um he he really is someone that doesn't uh sort of fit comfortably uh, as as you watch oh, yeah. and then you have Josefina, who has been relatively quiet, you know, she's there in in very much um, almost as a, a back character so far yeah. with the Vega brothers, and of course with the strength and presence of her mum, uh, Maria. And Matteo is someone who has been building this. He is like a pressure cooker, ready to explode, mm. and it really comes to a head here. Um, and leads to just so many, um, disturbing, uh, situations uh, and a you know, bloody, visceral, uh, murder here, uh, which is, it just really comes to a great climax, I think, uh, in this episode. Um, you know, we, we have Riley continuing his, his, his persecution of, of the Mexicans, mm-hmm. um, and, this really comes to a head as he puts Matteo and Josefina into his his crosshairs. And not only is he sort of violent towards Matteo, um, but then, you know, pulls that, that, I suppose in some ways it is a little bit of a trope, but that um, I'm going to search for a concealed weapon mm. uh, on Josefina, um, but effectively here sexually harasses her uh, and violates her. Um, whilst her brother is watching on. And in, in turn, this feeling of helplessness then from Matteo really just um, sinks further. And he effectively does boil over um, at the at the Vega family dinner, uh, whether, you know, both him and Josefina were getting groceries to bring back. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, unknown to... Um, both Maria, Tiago, and Raul. They don't know any of this. Uh, Josefina is, you will keep this quiet. So it's not only that um, Matteo is, wants to explode in terms of his frustration mm-hmm. uh, uh, and this pent up anger that has been building slowly, but so too, he's now, he's forced back into himself because of how Josefina wants to handle this in, in, a, in yeah. a very different way. And um, Such a tough scene to watch. It, it really is. Riley is just abhorrent, uh, and already has been in the show. If you if you didn't know he's one of the villains of the show, they certainly underline it in this yeah. episode. They really give him everything that you could possibly hate about a person is right there on screen, you know, from that opening scene where he's beating up a possible suspect. Um uh, in the murder, remember, this is what he's saying he's beating up this kid for. That's one of the kids from the from the Crimson Cat that he arrested last week. Um, yeah. This isn't someone that could be any way involved in or has any particular reason to be involved uh, in the murders that they're supposed to be investigating. Much like what was it? It's probably about 30 or 40 other uh, Chicanos who are all in, in in the two jail cells on either side. Uh, but Riley's taking out his racist frustration on this kid at the beginning of the episode and then He's using his privilege and using his abilities that he yeah. has as a police officer to abuse um, this young girl, Josefina. You yeah, know? absolutely. I'm, I'm wondering, is the reason why he goes as far as he goes with her, is it because he does recognize Mateo? Um, when he talks to me, he's, he looks in his face and then says, oh, I do know you. You're not as powerful as you were when you were around your, your Pachico friends. Um, and I wonder whether that's why he goes so far. Would he have gone that far if it wasn't for Mateo's connection to the Pachicos? Or was he intending to do that the minute he got out of the car? I, I think he does because we later find out that he abuses women, gives them drugs, yeah. and use them as sex slaves to a degree prostitutes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And just, just quickly, Chris, as well, I think on the flip side of it, would he have done that if he had known that that was Tiago's sister? Mm. Uh, that's, you know, that's the other interesting thing here because he doesn't seem to know that Matteo is his brother. That's true. Um, yeah. So it, it's, um, an interesting, uh, situation that, 
Riley finds himself in. Um, obviously, we'll come to the actual situation he finds himself in in a moment. But if it hadn't gone that way, would we have Tiago beating him uh, to death <laughs> as opposed to um, Tiago's younger brother? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so this is one thing I just want to want to get off my chest now, mm-hmm. which is the the actual assault scene. I we've all agreed that it was really difficult to watch. Oh yeah. I've seen loads of scenes of assault on film before. Mm-hmm. I don't know why this was harder to watch than most of the others. Yeah. Like this is just sticking in my brain, and I don't know whether it's the abuse because it's a policeman. Or the underage, or I, I don't know what element or the way it was acted. Mm-hmm. I definitely, part of it is the way it was acted. Like just a single tear running down Josephine's yeah. face and M- Matteo kind of screaming. And yeah. I think the two kids are so innocent, you know, Matteo and, and Josephine are seen as being very, very young yeah. kids, you know, especially Josephine. They're talking about their future. He's saying to her, you know, when you become famous, a famous actress, I'll be your bodyguard, you know, when you break yeah. away from all of the horror that we have to live in, in this horrible area of, of LA, these small houses, and you make your, you make your big name. And it's just before effectively her spirit is kind of crushed by yeah. having Riley do what he does. And it's, it's so well played. She, she does a great job because you almost feel that there's a kind of a timidity to her in the scenes beforehand, but the strength that comes out of, out of her afterwards when she's telling Matteo that he can't tell anybody else about it, she suddenly feels like a really strong older person yeah. because yeah. she's gone through this experience. And it is because her innocence has been taken away. You you can see it. She The, the actress in, in the role just does such a great job of getting across the horrible, painful nature of, of what's happening in the scene, I think. And I think you're right, Chris. It's one of those things you do see assault, sadly, uh, in, in films used a lot. They're, they're, they're sadly something that is put on screen a lot. But this is an adult show, and they're not shying away from the impact it's actually having on yeah. the character. And I think it's 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 done really well. I'm, I'm, I, I would totally echo your sentiments, Chris. That yeah. it's, it's something that is very much more affecting than I've seen in, in other things. Other things uh, yeah, it, it was affecting. I, I think that you know, it, it is down to the whole interaction. See, the brother seeing his sister being um, manhandled and and abused in that way. You know, Jonathan Neves does a really uh, great performance as well as Jessica Garza. And I mm. think as well, you know, at the heart of it, Rod McLaughlin, who plays Officer Riley, he has played this, this um, police officer in a way that, you know, I would say... There is no one with any sympathy for this character. Yeah. Um, the obnoxiousness of it, the pervasive sense of entitlement and arrogance and, and persecution that he brings, um, to the character. And, and, and then where he's kind of met his match, like in the, in, the, with Rico in the hospital. I, I think he, he, you know, he's played that really well. I mean, it just the, the, the tap on the rear end as he walks away. Oh. So he's not done anything wrong, but it's just cementing absolutely everything mm-hmm. all about what he's just done wrong to Josephina. And so, um, the whole three actors here yeah. were just amazing to absolutely. bring across just how unnerving and sort of um just awful that whole situation was and yeah. um, quick aside to this uh rob mclachlan apparently when he was on set of the crimson cast with all the you know the dancers and stuff and um, where he had that scene when he came in and, and was saying loads of racist terms apparently in between every take he was apologizing to all the actors yeah. around yeah. going look i'm really sorry it's in the script i have to say this and i'm gonna say it like i mean it but i don't mean it I genuinely would never say words like this in real life. And he was very apologetic. Apparently he's a lovely kind of, he's a very nice, friendly person. And saying this kind of stuff and doing these kind of scenes is really tough for him. So I just thought it was quite interesting. I saw that from one of the actors last week. Yeah. And I I, th- I think the other thing you mentioned about how Josefina comes across as really grown up. And you think about how she deals with it in comparison to how Matteo has dealt with his own frustrations or... um how he has felt Mm -hmm. and it it all really comes out on display at then the vega family dinner where really it does absolutely kick off and josephina actually gets ignored by her her mom in the moment because of the huge argument that's just spilled out uh with matteo Mm -hmm. um but 
she is trying to resolve exactly what's happened immediately by telling her mom and then that's not worked and she goes off to um the the joyful voices ministry yeah. so you know it's an interesting um difference in in how they're dealing with their own frustrations uh, as to this persecution that they both find themselves in mm -hmm. whereas matteo um i mean it, this this performance here is a is a force um uh, an absolute force of acting, I think, by Jonathan Neves, both in terms of um, his his words of saying, you know, you are all so fucking weak. Um, I'm tired of being weak, and for the first time, I feel strong. You know, he 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 dismisses his mum because he just she's just a cleaner, and um, he he dismisses Tiago because um, he kisses ass, mm -hmm. and and it's all down to the Pachuco symbol that is spotted by by Maria, and of course, it all just boils over and yeah. explodes. But in this moment, you get the sense that what with everything that's just happened to Josefina there with, with Riley. Um, and then effectively, because he can't say anything and because of the situation at the, the family dinner, this is where he becomes radicalized effectively and is helped along by, by Rico uh, of the Pachucos, mm -hmm. you know, that she knows what vein to tap. Uh, to to get him going because this is his expression um, and it is in such contrast to Josefina's um, expression of how she's going to deal with it. Yeah. What is the Pachuco symbol? That's the one I was saying. Is it just is it the cross or is it? Yeah, it's the cross with the four dots within um, around the the center mm -hmm. cross point. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just just between the the thumb and the finger there in that yeah. kind of notch. And you can see it. It's okay. something that's gone really throughout history with these types of groups, these types of uh, of effectively kind of gangs that have that have happened. You know, uh, that, that have been created. You see the reaction from Diego when he sees his younger brother going, "You'll be killed if you're seen with that mark on your on your skin." You know, there are people, there are cops in this city that will see that mark and will take it that you are instantly against them, and they will take you out just because of the mark. You know, he's he's worried, he's scared, and he's also angry that. Uh, his kid brother would go out and do this, you know. We yeah, we probably know it from things like you know skinheads back in the eighties. If you were walking around with a shaved head, that was an instant threat to the police. They would arrest you almost instantly for having the symbol that you're part of this gang, kind of thing, you know. So, uh, so I thought that was an an interesting moment between the two of them, and obviously Maria Vegas uh, is telling her son that she's massively disappointed instantly. She doesn't want it, want an explanation. She's effectively going, you've, uh, you've completely disappointed me. And, uh, and that's where their fight comes from. But it's a really good scene between all of them, you know, uh, interestingly, because we haven't really seen much of the reaction of, uh, zombie, uh, Vega, uh, at this point. <laughs> around, so, uh, I'm sorry. I'm so happy that it's, it's staying, <laughs> it's staying until something happens. But, but I did think it was interesting. He doesn't react much other than trying to calm the family down. Uh, yeah. in this in this part he doesn't take sides with anybody in the room um of, of course Josefina has just gone through this horrible experience doesn't also take sides she's more freaked out that there's a fight going on when everything's going on in her mind but Raul doesn't take a side between uh between Tiago and, and Matteo and, and Maria he kind of sits back and just says everybody calm down and that's it so will we see more from Raul in, in the future I hope we do but I think his personality has changed mm. because in the very first episode when we're introduced to him, he is, to be fair, one of the more hot-headed, antagonistic brothers. Mm -hmm. And now we see him joking about um, how his brother is going out with a gringa, yeah. uh, as he calls her. I have to say his turn of phrase on uh, on the line about uh, why it's much better to be with a, a Chicano woman rather than a gringa. I loved the idea where he goes, you know who you are with a Chicano woman. Um, she makes you chase her until she catches you. And I love that turn of phrase. It's it's just so, it's such yeah. an interesting little observation. It's still a funny conversation between two brothers as well. I just thought that was good. You know, I'll, I'll make sure that I make a good speech at your wedding. <laughs> when Tiago says, I haven't even been on a date with this woman, just had one meeting with her. And he's like, I'll make a good speech at your wedding. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, but zombie bro will come back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I think... Um, I think uh, zombie bro is probably still in, in recuperation here. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly someone who needs to maybe calm down, but unfortunately is not in that place. We get the death of uh, Officer Riley at the hands mm. of Matteo. Um, I found this 
really uh, tough to watch. I watched it twice uh, in terms of bringing my notes together. Mm -hmm. And each time, I think just the visceral nature of how it was done just really um, struck me. And I, I think it's because, you know, a death where the person who is effectively being killed still struggles. Yeah. I, I find, um, and, and because it's not a single sort of wound, it's not like a gunshot to the head or stepping on a mine. This is something where even Matteo has to see it all the way through hands on yeah. from the moment he puts the razor in the side of Riley's neck all the way through to, um, having a, 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 a tussle with him to, sort of just continually slicing his neck and it was bloody and there is a fantastic uh, i think the shot is fantastic of mateo looking down at riley the um blood stained mm -hmm. with his razor uh, and the look in his eyes is devilish it, it looks like he's been taken on by a demon it it felt to me like the the moments in Penny Dreadful, the original three series, were uh, Malcolm Murray was uh, possessed by demons, where you really get the dark, full, fully black eyes. Right. It, it felt um, that sort of devilish, and I think you know here what we're seeing is absolutely a change in Matteo. And we have, I think, what's been born here is this split with his brothers. This is, you know, the war of brothers. It started at the dinner table, but it's been building. Mm -hmm. and, and Rio has pushed the button on, on this war uh, of brothers. Mm. Um, and to top it off, uh, Riley is tossed in front of the police station, bloody, naked, and very, very much dead. So uh, there is this message sent to the LAPD, which is going to ignite things even further. I mean, Absolutely. you know, from the start of this episode, seeing Riley doing what he was doing in the police station, and now you have Riley effectively going to be the trigger for the LAPD to be even um, less uh, accommodating and tolerant of Mexicans um, is, is going to be interesting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They keep using the S word. It keeps getting harder to listen to. I know. And I was just like, and I, I know why they're using it from a historical perspective. It would have been used. And it's just when you see Tiago even talking to the captain, yeah. and it's just basically make this stop, solve the case, yeah. and we'll stop. We'll look at otherwise the interrogations will continue. Mm -hmm. The dead body of a police officer. Uh, and when you already have the councilman basically showing off the bloody shirt mm -hmm. of a previous lawman who had died uh, in the original first episode. Yeah. This is literally, this isn't the straw that breaks the camel's back. This is the two-ton sledgehammer that smashes the camel's back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and that really kind of kicks off. Yeah. And I, I know we last episode discussed the Pachuco War the Zutu riots that mm -hmm. happened later on in like in another four or five years, um, I think they'll they might move things slightly forward just for artistic license. I, I even um, I'm even wondering whether we would get there at all. I'm wondering whether the uh, the LAPD are just going to come uh, all guns blazing uh, after this. Yeah. Uh, whether this yeah. whether there's going to be any war at all, I don't know. Um, because the the interesting thing about the push from Rio to go and take revenge on Riley is that what Rio says is that she wants to make his face look just like he left one of their brothers, the, yeah. the kid who was beaten at the start, who has a few bruises, a black eye. You know, he looks like he's definitely been roughed up, but she certainly didn't indicate to anybody that she wanted them to go out there and murder a police officer and drop his dead naked body in front of the police station. You know, this escalated as it went on and they've fallen into a plan you know um also one thing to say definitely this episode shows you penny dreadful isn't just your standard um good guy versus bad guy thing where you know the bad guy riley finally gets his comeuppance and they shoot him and kill him and then they leave him you know that <laughs> there's much more difficult things in this show you know you wanted to see riley get his comeuppance 
okay, he gets killed, but you've got to sit there and watch him get his throat sliced open and him bleeding to death on the floor. You've got to sit there with the characters and see how brutal, how brutally a murder yeah. is going to look on screen. You know, they really will show you that stuff. Yeah. Just on that, in so many other shows, they would have showed Mateo stand behind Riley, slice mm. his throat, <laughs> as blood pours out. <laughs> yeah. And the, I didn't mean like, to laugh there. No, it, was this, just, it was just your impersonation of someone losing all their blood through from the neck. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as my hands fail. Um, no, but in this, they were like, oh, no, no, no. When you slice someone with a barbershop knife uh-huh. in, like, across the neck, it doesn't just kind of, go through all one way in straight away. No, you've got to saw for a bit. Yeah. And you see Mateo saw the carotid artery yeah. Yeah. to get down there. And yes. it's just like yeah. spraying up and I was like, Oh, okay. But I will take, uh, very quickly. I will take umbrage or challenge with Rio just saying that we'll leave him. I think this is. This is Rio. This is oh, yeah. Rio. Like, there's a line or well-known line. It was like, I will, I'll be the spark. It basically, she is the spark to this powder keg. Absolutely. And yeah. I'm still trying to figure out where the others, what the other sparks are going to explode. Mm-hmm. But very much, we now know what the Rio spark is. Yeah. It's that she's igniting the race riot part. Yeah. Uh, of, we, again, nation versus nation, brother versus brother, race versus race, yeah. back to the prophecy. The, the Rio is igniting she's the, ig- the race. Yeah, well, she's igniting both. She's igniting race and brothers because she has given Matteo the place to vent his frustration. Um, and he's done that. And even before this, with um, the first meeting, you know, he got the tattoo yep. he felt belong it's hence what he says to his own family he sees them now as being weak that they're yep. somehow hiding um it's probably why he doesn't say anything but he probably disapproves of josephina um in a sense keeping it to herself in that moment and that he can't say anything yes he respects it in that moment mm. but he's seeing all his family as being weak and that's coming from how he has been given his confidence and his strength through the Pachucos, but through Rio. And then, as you say, there is the, the, um, the, the tinderbox, which has just been happened with, um, uh, Riley being dumped in front of the police station. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, it is absolutely Rio's way of, of doing this because you, you, you saw Rico. Yes, he's gone along with it, but he has been more held back yeah. in, in that at the Crimson Cat where they're discussing about targeting Riley. It is because uh, Matteo stands up and the guy who's been beaten up in, in the uh, police station at the start of the episode where he it says, I'm with you. And in a sense, Rio is forcing Rico's hand uh, to, to move in, in this way. Um, so, it, it, that is really, um, like interesting. And as you say, Chris, I think what this death shows is the struggle of killing in, yeah. in that not only it's not clean with a barber's razor, but when your opponent is a large police officer who's struggling and grasping at life, it's even harder. It's dirty. It's hands on. It's unpleasant. It's brutal. It's all of that. Um, and yeah, you know, you all wanted Riley to have his comeuppance. Yeah. And for me, it probably doesn't make great sort of uh, TV, but it would be that he gets justice served to him. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, this is violent justice. This is a vengeance. This is revenge mm-hmm. by uh Matteo and the other guy as well um, who I think has knuckle dusted him beforehand so um you see him with a knuckle duster so uh Riley certainly has uh been the the message to to the LAPD um yeah. for sure yeah yeah, a little bit more about the actual point though as well I know you want to talk a little bit about Josephine meeting Sister Molly as well in the episode John 
Yeah, I think for me again, discuss this that she, you know, she's gone to the Joyful uh, Voices Ministry, mm. and and she connects with that sermon, that preaching from from Molly. She hasn't been listened to by a mom in that moment. That's not to say that Maria Vega wouldn't um, listen to her, her her daughter at that moment, but in this moment, she has sought solace and a way of trying to deal with it by going to the, um, the ministry, mm-hmm. uh, the Joyful Voices Ministry. Mm-hmm. And here she she connects with with Molly, and I suppose just because of the title of the episode, which is Josefina and the Holy Spirit, that is Molly here in the form of the Holy Spirit. There is that moment where she is looking up at the, the ceiling of, of um, the auditorium and she's murmuring something. It, it's like this idea that she becomes possessed in a way and, and the change in behaviour is noticed by Mrs Adelaide, her mother, um, and kind of takes her back. You see her, her mum kind of almost hugging herself, you know, yeah. that, that moment just to kind of steady herself. And I know you've mentioned it as well previously, Derek, that is she trying to call on some kind of spirit or whatever? So I'm just wondering, is Molly here the effectively the epistotal Catholic evangelical version of Santa Mercer, or she's calling upon that, the the Holy Spirit or or the Virgin Mary? Uh, And it's also just because her and Tiago are connecting as well yeah because he's been touched by santa mercer that he somehow has some root to her and maybe molly does uh, uh, as well yeah. but not to santa mercer to the holy spirit the virgin mary uh, whoever it may be yeah it's very hard to tell with this show isn't it because these are the exact same tactics that an evangelical minister uses to try and get people to donate to their ministry you know this is a ministry that makes a lot of money these are the exact things that they do they jump around the stage they take away people's pain they cure people of illnesses they couldn't possibly be cured from in any other way so therefore they must have an actual direct connection to some form of higher power kind of thing um she doesn't actually say it she says the devil is in the room she says god is around us she says i need to protect you And then she does this moment where she looks up in the sky and it seems to take Mrs. Adelaide by surprise that she's going this far with it. But it could all be part of the act, of course. It could as well. But this is Penny Dreadful, so you have to ask, you know, is there going to be a moment where we find out that when she was a young girl, she was possessed by what she is explaining is a Holy Spirit? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's another demon. You know, this could be something that is coming out over the next few episodes. Uh, And I mean, I'm really intrigued just by this moment, whether it will just be this is the play that she puts on for everybody to get money for her mother and the organization, or she's actually being possessed by a demon and translating it as the Holy Spirit. So we are reintroduced again to Santa Muerte uh, at the beginning of this episode, Mm -hmm. uh, who she does not interact with. She does not involve herself directly. And that's what she said before. I don't involve, I don't do it directly. My job is this one thing. Yeah. She doesn't care for the living. She yes. cares for the souls of the dead. Yeah. Molly is talking about souls. Molly is talking about everything. So I am wondering, could it be Santa Muerte doing this, produ- uh, this possession? Yeah. Or does she talk to Molly? Mm-hmm. So. Like, that's that why Molly and Tiago potentially are linked or l- find each other and kind of are drawn to each other mm-hmm. is because they're both touched by Santa Muerte. Perhaps, yeah. 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 Um, because some would see Santa Muerte as the Holy Spirit or like a, uh, the, the person that brings that the souls with them to heaven, mm-hmm. wherever. Um, could that just be uh, Santa Muerte is the Holy Spirit just in a different form? Blah, yeah. blah, blah. I don't know. I don't know whether we have an equivalent in the Christian religion. I know, I know we have death in some religions. That is the, yeah. the thing that transports the souls to the beyond effectively. And the, the fairy, fairy man. man. Yeah, exactly. They're both of us saying at exactly the same time. Um, yeah. Like there are, in, you know, in Norse religions and in, uh, in Greek religions, you know, there are different versions of this character. Santa Muerte is the angel of death is, is another description for her as well. So I don't know whether it's a direct connection to what we would think of as a Holy Spirit, but I can certainly get 
if she is channeling some form of angel or some form of, de- yeah. of demon that in her own Christian mind, she may be thinking this is, I'm definitely got a connection to the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. You know? yeah. I think, um, you know, we've seen with Maria, she has had to encant to Santa Muerta to, to, to bring her to talk with her mm. and so on. So it, it's either that Molly knows about Santa Muerta through an experience. Cause we do see at the start that again, the, 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 the child who was gone down at Ensenada in Mexico seems to notice her. So maybe at yeah. some point she yeah. noticed Santa Muerta. The reason why I was thinking because of the Holy Spirit that, you know, not that it necessarily has to be exactly like Santa Muerta in terms of someone ferrying souls that are, have died, but just the, the spiritual, um, nature of it, that there is this conduit that she has got. And it may be Santa Muerta. It may be the Holy Spirit. Um, in the same way that Tiago, that connection, he has this, this touch of her. And so maybe has this conduit, which his mom has been, um, talking about. That's the, that's why I was bringing that up because, yeah. um, it seems here that there is more to Molly and her connection to yeah. Tiago, but also potentially to Josefina now as yeah. well. Um, and maybe that's uh, another thing that we will have built on. Absolutely. Absolutely. As I said at the beginning of the episode, we could talk about each of these points for an hour each. We're not going to talk about them for that long. Chris, no. do you want to take us on to the next, uh, the next big point from the episode? Yes. Uh, so very quickly, mine is very much related to this, which is Tiago and Molly. Okay. Um, so that is that kind of the other trifecta, which is Tiago, the death and Molly. Mm-hmm. So in the last episode, we, we speculated was, Molly with Hazlitt. Did she, was she having an affair? Mm-hmm. Is that real? Was that just Michener kind of, kind of believing it to be true? Was, um, Hazlitt trying to help Molly? No, they flat out prove it in this episode. She was, she is a woman. She has needs. She was with Hazlitt, as she says, yeah. and she has been with other men too. Mm-hmm. Um, she just wanted an escape. She wants to be normal. Yep. That's what that house was. Um, so we get Tiago, to be fair, doing his rifling around. We see the lubricated Trojans mm-hmm. while Tiago was doing the, um, rummaging mm-hmm. of the house, the investigation of the house. I was like, Oh, this is just the Hazlitt's house. Basically, it's a wife. Oh, right. No. <laughs> and I was like going, Oh, this is nice. And like, is it Hazlitt and his wife? Like, it's their summer home. He was embezzling the money yeah. and etc. Then the Trojans were there yeah. and I was like, Hmm, no. And then all of a sudden Molly's there. I'm like, and she just admits. It's like, no, I've, I'm sleeping with men. Yeah. I've had men before, before you and everything. And to be fair, straight away, I'm like, Go, girl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You don't have a relationship with Tiago, aside from your beautiful moment uh, down on the piers. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, no, like, put him in his place. <laughs> he doesn't own you. Like, yeah, stand up. Uh-huh. I have to say there is a moment with Tiago when he finds those uh, those Trojans in the drawer. You can see <laughs> yeah. his face drop going, oh, oh, damn it. <laughs> it's like the, she's not the woman I thought she was. You know, the, yeah. she's not the one that she sold. And, and I love that it's addressed in the conversation with Molly where she says, we were both different people yesterday. We were both pretending to be other people. You told me that I could. You know, that's what he says to her at the bus stop. He says, why don't we try and be different people for one day? And they were. And they fell he thinks they fell in love in that day, you know. Um, it does play out much nicer towards the end of the episode, of course. But uh, but she's having that <laughs> moment where um, she's saying she's saying to him, you know, you gave me the opportunity. I was a different person. I didn't tell you every single secret I have in my life. And is it shocking to find that I have got a life outside of that moment that we spent together yesterday? Yeah. You know. Because well, that's true. Like- you you say that it plays out better. I must say. Uh, to to um, use the words of her goss, I love what it does to us. Um, given <laughs> that he is connecting over dirty dishes, mm-hmm. uh, he must really love her to do the washing up uh, <laughs> as as a date. Can you imagine? I, I, thought, I did think that was sweet. Yeah. I, I literally was not expect. I was expecting him to burn. <laughs> Burn the bridge down, and we would come back to the sister Molly from a Tiago storyline perspective towards the end. Okay, and I'm actually—it's like no, they showed 
Now, they haven't shown this conversation, but I think there's a level of acceptance here where we're going to see more of Molly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, and not just from the Josephina potentially possessed route. Yeah. Like, this is that, no, no, look, she's a woman with womanly needs. She's human. She is just basically wants relationships. She wants a partner. <laughs> she wants just normal life, not just being Sister Molly. Mm -hmm. Um, they're going to say, actually, my real name's not even Molly. It's Kate or something <laughs> weird like that. I, th I must say, I thought she did that really well. That was just fantastic. You really felt, as you say, Chris, you really felt her despair at having to put on the act um, to the parishioners, in a sense, mm. or for her mom, even, whatever it may be. Yeah. That, that sense from her portrayal, though, was really, really good. It, it makes sense what we, when we were first introduced to yeah. her, and she's sitting behind the curtain, and we were like, is she in a trance? Is she? No, she's just... Like an actor preparing for to go on stage, mm -hmm. she's putting on the persona of Sister Molly. She's becoming Sister Molly, where she's like, "All right, build yourself, yeah. psych yourself up for the big presentation." I still think it, that could have been an indication she was being possessed at that time. No, as well. no, no. Sorry, well, I'm not yeah. saying she's not. Yeah. And I think there's definitely a massive question mark on the whole supernatural slash Sister Molly mm -hmm. angle, and I think. We're, they'll dive into it soon enough. We're going to get to the end of the season and there's going to be no supernatural element with her at all. I yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but then, but it's, 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 it's exact. it's pain mm -hmm. You're led to believe that. But skipping to the end, I enjoyed the, this reconciliation mm -hmm. where there's no words. Yeah. It was just like, can I come in and help? Yeah. And she hands him the, uh, the dirty dish and they go back because it it it's only that we know that this is her safe space mm -hmm. that she calls that out in the very first episode this is where i come to be alone to think yeah. blah 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 yeah. and that she's he's inviting her back in so i'm like okay we're in a good spot yeah because um, i did think that it was kind of early doors uh, for the two of them, because she says, "I don't want to ever see you again." But yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. It was, it was lovely and sweet. Um, it's just, I suppose, if you asked to meet over some dirty dishes, but you're right. That sh that's her safe spot. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, her, it's her safe spot. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it, it, meet me by the dirty dishes. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Um, yeah, you'd probably get a slap these days, or meet me by the dishwasher as we load it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, to have it. Uh, although I like personally, I, I'm I'm with Molly on this. I, I welcome to inside baseball for uh, TV podcast industries on Chris. I enjoy doing the dishes because I'm exactly like Sister Molly. My brain turns off. I go into automatic mode. It's just wax on, wax off, <laughs> clean, put away. Don't put wax on um, your dishes. Anyway, yeah, back anyway. to page don't off. wax on, wax off oh, unless you've got a karate bout to win. <laughs> I always have a karate bout to win. <laughs> In my mind. <laughs> so moving on uh, from one cop to the other, because I think we kind of covered Tiago and Molly. The big, the biggest part for me, and we discussed it, and you actually brought it up very quickly at the beginning of this episode, Derek, was Mitchner and the Jews and the Nazi plot. Um. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I know I said. I wanted more last episode in terms of the Werner von Braun. And I admitted to that. And I'm, I'm actually sticking to that. I think I could have done with more then, mm -hmm. but you're right. They, they did it for a reason. And I hate saying that you're right, <laughs> but you were right. They did it. They held back for a reason on explaining Werner von Braun yeah. because we have to get introduced to the Jewish gang, the underground. Mm -hmm. The, the the Jewish mafia, the Jewish mafia, probably, um, yeah, yeah. It sounds like a joke. It's just like the the the, the gay mafia, the the Jewish mafia. Oh, right. It's all big and gender. Well, no, no, there was actually apparently a Jewish mafia back then. Oh, it's it's pro it's big. It's uh, it's massively well known as well. I'm, I'm I've, I think I've mentioned before that that I used to read a lot of of crime books, of true crime books, um, about gangsters uh, when I was when I was younger. Um, the Jewish gangsters well, that explains everything. Yeah, it truly does. <laughs> the Jewish gangsters, you know, there, there's a there was a massive cohort uh, of them, very well known. Uh, one of the pre people that's mentioned 
mentioned by Michener uh, in the conversation between himself and Benny Berman, uh, the the connection, I suppose. He mentions his boss, Mayor Lansky. Uh, Mayor Lansky was known as the mob's accountant. Um, he was a, a real figure in uh, during the early days and probably instrumental in the setting up of organized crime across America. He was the one that dealt with clearing the money and dealt with the books for uh, for the, the mafia, uh, for gangsters and the, the mob all across America. So, uh, so yeah, very well-known figure uh, in, in, uh, in crime scenes. See, I just thought, I found it funny, be, sorry, funny, not funny, haha, <laughs> funny, interesting, in that you think of the mob, you think of the Italians, you think of Al Capone and hey, mamma mia, and that stereotype. But we get introduced to one of my favorite actors, Brad Garrett. Right. Like, I, he's currently on Single Parents season two, where he plays, a. uh, uh plastic surgeon and it's just funny mm -hmm. he has his comedic chops there but you see it here and he's the he plays the towering mobster because he's what like six um, he's six three or six four yeah at least yeah, yeah. he's huge yeah. put him beside nathan lane mm -hmm. and the 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 difference is huge nathan lane looks like a doll he looks tiny in comparison to yeah. Him, yeah and then you put the two of the ones seats at the funeral, mm -hmm. or at the end of the funeral, and you see, you start to see where Michener, as a character, not just as a cop, not as a detective, you see him as a force, where he's now, he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the mob, mm -hmm. but going, this, I'm put, I'm not coming to you as a detective, like, I need to speak to Mayor Lance, mm -hmm. and we get, no, you do not talk about that. And then he goes, no, this is about Judea. This is, they're going to, they, they are going to burn us down. Mm -hmm. And you get Benny pushing back going, no, like, we're mobs. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't care. Like, this is not about yeah. us. And it's then explain just beautifully me, yeah. woven later <laughs> on. Yeah, absolutely. Ex explain to me why this should matter to me that, that the Nazis are are coming kind of thing. We're in LA, we're so far away from Germany, you know, this this idea that they're on the other side of the world from Germany. Why does it matter? There's no way the Nazis could be there. And I love the explanation that Michener gives to him. Yeah. Well, you guys got here because it's a really easy city to control. You think yeah. the Nazis didn't think like that? You think the Nazis who were looking for a foothold in America didn't think, well, maybe we should go for LA where everything's easy, everything's a pushover, we can pay off the right people and we can get people in the right positions and take over the city, you know? Of course they did. And he tries to talk about, say, the rockets. Mm -hmm. So we, this is where we have Vernon Von Brown. He goes, the, the kids in Caltech. Mm -hmm. And he goes, they'll steal this technology from the kids in Caltech yeah. and they'll be able to put a rocket in, in London, in Paris, in New York. Yeah. In Jerusalem, which is even more important to him. And then he goes, in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And that's where you go, that's, this is where the points are coming across. Mm -hmm. um, and then very quickly, we're reintroduced to Benny via a beautiful mob-style uh, kidnapping. Mm -hmm. It's like, you get the, the very classic hood. It's like, hey, grab him. And they bring him off. And we're reintroduced to Benny in the fish market. And I was like, oh... Like, at least it wasn't a butcher shop or something. Yeah. Pretty close. Um, <laughs> pretty close. Exactly. Just massive fish hanging. But I liked how this was tied back to the very beginning. Mm -hmm. it back to Mexico. Because I, my assumption on this was it was, like, it was the Nazis stealing this. Because that's, you're, you're just, you're assuming now that the bad guys are the Nazis in this. Mm -hmm. So anyone kind of going against anyone is the bad guys. It's the Nazis. And we get to see the background of how this is now affecting the mob mm -hmm. in that their shipments are being stolen and being sold to the Nazis yeah. by another Jew. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, this is where it starts to get interesting. But to be fair, Benny says, shoot him. Mincher says, does he tells him where to put yeah. it? He stands up what he believes in, Absolutely. quote unquote. Okay. Absolutely, he's looking for help. He's not looking to sell a soul to the devil, basically. Yeah. You know, and that, that's that's why he would refuse it. But Mister Schiff did not last very long no. there at all. Even no. even though uh, Mitchner refuses, and I have to say, um, the shot as they walk out of the room, effectively saying, "You know, we will be on your side because, but there will be blood and death." Uh, as as Judea rises again kind of thing uh, as they all walk out of the room and the shot of Mitchner standing there as the body 
spins around almost to look towards him after he's been shot. It's, yeah, it's such that was really good. Timed. Yeah, that was perfect timing. Yeah. I, I liked how um, the the scene was slightly cut with Riley's ordeal as well, um, because ultimately yeah. Michener retains his integrity as a cop just because i mean it, it's it is cops and criminals working together here mm-hmm. um he's doing it for the whole zionist cause the protection of uh jewish uh people but it's still a cop working with the mafia it, it's one of those great things where penny dreadful has these layers of gray so i, I still don't think of uh, michener as being a bent or corrupt cop yeah. and i think him refusing to shoot Schiff um, is really important yeah. uh, in that, even though they are about to go and do business together mm-hmm. uh, with them. Uh, so he keeps his, um, he does keep his integrity here. And I, I again, this ordeal of Michener with, um, with, with Benny Berman is intercut with, um, Riley uh, a little. Now it's a different type of ordeal, certainly. Well, except for for Mister Schiff, who mm-hmm. does get his brains blown out. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, for sure, I think this is this is really nice. Um. And it was kind of a nice little potted history of, I suppose, the a free Judea or Israeli state as well. I, I like that. Um. I like the fact that they, you know, New York is closed to the Nazis because of LaGuardia. Um. AKA LaGuardia Airport, <laughs> um, because uh, he's half Jewish. The mayor. Yeah, yes, Mayor, mayor right. LaGuardia. <laughs> yeah, just in case, because I, yeah, I couldn't exactly. remember that he was named after the mayor of, I, I, of New York at the time. Yeah. I didn't know LaGuardia was the mayor. Mm. I knew it was obviously a person, so yeah. yeah. I didn't even know that. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually thought they meant the airport <laughs> because they couldn't get a hold of it. Makes more sense. Yes, the, air, okay. the airport is not half Jewish, Chris. <laughs> Almost impossible. I think it is hey, impossible. I, yeah. I, no, I, I'm anything. I, I'm equal opportunity when it comes to religious buildings. It's penny dreadful. It could be possessed. Exactly. Oh, no. well, it's like Hell House, but Hell Airport, which is probably every airport at the moment. Yeah, it's true. Have you been to LAX then? That's, <laughs> that's definitely part of Hell. But anyway, that's kind of enough of my points. Uh, I think there is one final point that we need to talk about very badly. Derek, do you want to give us your point for this episode? Yep, I'm going to wrap everything up in uh, in one point for me. Um, because A big bow, big yeah, bow. Yeah, it's a big bow, really. It's it's Magda taking her revenge on everyone through all of her personas. It kind of ties into every single storyline and gives us the ability to talk about the two major storylines we haven't talked about in the episode as well. Um, so we've already talked about uh, about Rio's kind of connection and, and the revenge that she's taken by using Matteo effectively to kind of start kick off that war with the police. I think we talked in last week's episode about that moment with Alex where she lost control really of, uh, of Councilman Townsend and he was walking away from her and she turned back into Magda and we wondered what Magda was going to do. Would we see Magda personified again, doing some kind of attack, some kind of killing of people around her. And I think if I understand what's happening in this episode, actually, we see Magda using all of her personas to take revenge on everybody around her. We see uh, Rio using the people that are around her, the Pachucos, to take revenge on the police for their attack on the club, effectively. We see Alex definitely taking revenge on Councilman Townsend for, for disobeying her. She's now now in proper league with Goss and with uh, and with Curse, she's using Curse to abduct um, Councilman Tens and and effectively make a videotape of him that she can blackmail him into doing whatever she needs him to do. You know, I love the kind of conversation between the two of them, between um, between Alex and uh, and Goss, where they're saying, <laughs> you know, well, at least he's going to be. Um, He's going to be with one of ours. He's not going to have to go out and pay for it anymore. Uh, at least we have uh, someone that will take care of him of, of all his needs. And Goss going, well, Kurt will definitely do that for him. Kurt knows exactly what, what well, this all entails. You know? Yeah, I, I I must say I did think her Goss uh, was was priceless saying that line. 
uh, just the intonation of like our love, uh, what it does to us, just mm -hmm. with the projector flickering between him and Alex, having just seen the image of what's being projected there. And he is calmly sort of smoking his cigarillo um, with, with a glass of, of his favorite tipple. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought his composure with being very matter of fact with what was going on on the screen mm -hmm. was just uh, really uh, really good and let's just say there'll be none of that uh, for the dreadful pub quiz uh, whilst we uh, enjoy our favourite tipple <laughs> uh, we'll have no raunchy blue visuals going on uh, there but uh, I, I just like their conversation uh, between him and Alex and that last moment because her goss is really quite sophisticated in mm -hmm. a sense and I, I like you know he won't just kill councilwoman beck and in the same way well we'll just hold this i'm you know in case we need it along with with alex uh i thought it was just nicely played yeah. by uh her goss absolutely and i have to say the scene itself uh as curse is abducting castleman towns and did anybody else think this is how it was going to play out i definitely thought yeah. he was going to end off at the bottom of a ditch as soon you know? as they moved well he ended up on the bottom yeah that's a exactly as soon as they went into the motel i oh, thought yeah. then no i mean drove in i thought yeah. okay but absolutely up till that point i thought like it was played really really nicely by uh michael gladys the the panic mm -hmm. um as he's you know going even further into the remote hills around LA yeah, that he's basically going to get a bullet because yeah. let's face it his hustler um that was pretty brutal like he opens to leave and it's dum dum you know it's like the silence of thought of a gun which is really kind of slightly disturbing anyway yeah. Uh, but yeah that hustler um in his prime uh looking fairly magnificent um and yeah gone Snuffed, to the head. snuffed out yeah but they they did ensure that you got a line from him that he was about to rip off the councilman again you know he was saying to him i know we we agreed in 500 you know yeah and um, so you you do know this kid is not uh, the nicest of people either so uh, just before he gets shot in the head but it's the whole scene is played so well with dominic share with the who plays the character of kurt where uh, where you have councilman in the back trying to open the doors as he gets to as the car slows down and, and kirk go into him you can't get out it's control from up here um you know you and doesn't say anything more to him uh, even when questioned about whether he's american or not you know you hear the the accent from him and councilman's going hang on a second you're american you're supposed to be part of the gestapo and he goes no no i'm many things and um, yeah. you know these really short answers not to assuage any fears not to calm him down at all um before they get into the hotel uh that yeah they, it just felt like a real out of nowhere surprise that this definitely. was happening between the two of them um there was definitely a bit of silence when i was live tweeting uh, this moment there's a lot of fans <laughs> of dominic sherwood i keep forgetting whether i've mentioned this in the show dominic sherwood is a is an actor who is very big in uh, in a very popular television show with a, a certain demographic of people who are all massive fans of dominic sherwood and i think they went quite silent when they were live tweeting <laughs> along and this moment happened it was completely unexpected for for most people i would say their dreams crushed in a black and white image i don't know where they crushed <laughs> or, or or not or, yeah exactly or not, yeah exactly <laughs> i say a lot of people could have been very De happy depending on which preference absolutely um so but i i like the idea that dreams were made and crushed in in one swoop much like what Magda does. Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> that's so that's kind of Alex's revenge. We know now she's probably got Kansom and Townsend back in her pocket uh, for whatever else she needs him to do uh, in future. And then the other kind of big, well, massive story from the episode really is uh, is Elsa um, going over to the party in Dr. Kraft's house. Um, so I think this revenge which is effectively the sex scene that she has with Dr. Kraft. I think this actually comes about because of the challenge from uh, Dr. Kraft's wife uh, that we heard at the beginning of the show, the, the moment, because I don't think she was intending on having sex with him there. She did tell him last time um, that she wasn't going to have sex in the house of her fictional husband, as we know, uh, that Dr. Kraft doesn't know is fictional, but we know that she wasn't, uh, I believe that she wasn't intending to go there to to have sex with them but when she got challenged she was like okay this is the way i'm going to manipulate this man into leaving this wife who thinks she can still control him um and then finally we also have the manipulation of the fifth persona of magda i suppose uh, if you count magda fifth persona is frank right because he was left there on his own at a sleepover with the rest of the yep. kids 
And not only does he tell the scary story of the scary true story of uh, Florence, um, the kid who unfortunately was murdered with uh, arms taken off and eyes sewn open. Mm. He also enters the nightmares of Tom, the kid who kind of recognized who he was. He enters the nightmares as another character, another persona. He actually is Florence in his dreams. Like the idea that Magda is there as Frank and then is also cladding himself in the body of Florence and waking Tom up to show that he's there. You know, that's, it's terrifying. I don't know if that was in his mind. Yeah. I think because they can morph the body, I literally think Frank became... Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I said, yeah, yeah. Oh, not... Yeah, sorry. No, I thought you meant he entered the nightmare. No, no, no. Yeah. He, he literally, it like, just met him, transformed, like, from... Evil Frank yep. to evil Max. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought when you said he was in his nightmares, it was almost like a Freddy Krueger no. thing. But that was, yeah, it seemed to me like he was taking on poor Florence in all her forms in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. No, I was. I mean, he's entering in his nightmares because he's going to be having nightmares about that moment for the rest oh, of yeah. his life and yeah. thinking it might have been a dream. It wasn't a dream. That yeah. was terrifying. The job they did on that version of Florence, the limbless version of her, uh, when she's staring, screaming at him, uh, was terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I still... So, yes, Magda's taking revenge, and I agree with you on, that. on this one. The challenge... I think potentially because you're correct because she's then somewhat flirting with this other gentleman that we get introduced to the other Nazi um, who we see at the very first episode with Dr. Kraft. Ethan Peck plays the character. Yeah. Herman Ackerman is the character. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, and I think then it is the challenge of uh, Dr. Kraft's wife. Mm-hmm which you played in the intro, uh, it really does seem to be that's potentially it. I just still don't know where this is going. This is the one that's conf- not confusing okay. me. This is the one that I'm like, okay, I, I, I don't know how this is going to bring about the prophesized end mm. right now. This is the one I'm like, all the other ones I can kind of see. Right. This is the one where I'm like, yeah, she's just going to be the doctor's mistress. Well, I, I would feel in the same way that Rio has effectively aided to the radicalization of Matteo. Yeah. Um, I feel that Elsa is aiding to the radicalization of Dr. Kraft. You know, we see this group of people feeling that they're not being listened to anymore. They have gone out to the parks. They've tried to share their word. And you hear uh, Herman Ackerman saying, if we could just get on the radio, then everybody in the country could hear what we want to say. He's trying to pervert the nation with their thoughts in the same way that Sister Molly is doing with her evangelical Christian thoughts on the radio waves, you know. And you hear that the re- the thing that's stopping them from some of the Nazis that are there, or some of the fascists that are there, they're saying the reason why they can't do that is because, well, the Jews own the ra- own, own the radio waves and they won't let us on board. Um, so there is that ant- antagonism that's being built up and she's stoking yeah. those fires. You know, we, we mentioned before, she's not the person that's saying this is the end game and you have to go there and you have to do this. She's whispering in their ear, giving them some guidance as the path that they are probably going to follow. And that end point they're going to get to is where she wants them to go without saying it directly. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I was also, I I think it's, I think there is a melting pot element here to this whole storyline in that maybe one of these story threads is a kickoff. It's the idea that the melting pot of all these different people and different cultures. So the, the, You've got the Mexicans, the the Jewish, you've got Germans there as well. You've got people who see themselves as American patriots in, in Townsend. This melting pot is leading to sort of this domino effect to mm-hmm. a, a, a bigger thing. Um, and I, I think there's an element of that to me in that the melting pot here is causing the tensions. It, it's driving the tensions that spill downwards towards a family and upwards to effectively a world war. Um, And I I think there's an element of that. So for me, yeah, and I suppose more, it's only really this episode where he's mentioning about getting on the radio that maybe this is the connection in with, say, the Molly Mm -hmm. uh, element to it. Um, But otherwise, 
up till now, I've just really been thinking that uh, Elsa, yeah, is trying to radicalize um, Dr. Kraft um, in the same way that Rio has radicalized Mateo. And Alex is effectively, in a different way, radicalizing Townsend to make radical decisions, Mm -hmm. I suppose, um, that he wouldn't normally have gone down. Um, But yeah, it, it, I know what you mean, Chris. It, it, it's a toughie. Um, it, yeah. It's like even on this, I want to see more of Linda Craft now as well. Because exactly. I loved her in this garden she party. Yeah. She yeah. does a superb resting bitch face, mm-hmm. um, which oh, yes. I want to see more of. Yeah. Um, and that, that opening to the podcast, that little sort of, you know, Putting Elsa in her place, um, little does she know, I suppose, but it's just great. Yeah. Uh, the henpeck is very nicely done by Linda Cartcraft here. Um, so good. Yeah, absolutely. And I do, it does ask those questions that we have no idea about. It's questions that we're, again, probably going to find out as the series goes on. What did happen in Essen? What is about exactly. Dr. Yeah. Kraft's family? Like, does that mean he has another family, as in wife and kids? Or did he turn over his own family to the Nazis before leaving Essen? Is that something about his, you know, his parents and his brothers and sisters, you know, that kind of stuff, you know? So it really intrigued to know uh, why it is that she effectively hates Dr. Kraft so much. Why is it that she doesn't like him and why is it that she's saying she has stuck with him? Um, so yeah. there's some really intriguing stuff that I'm sure we're going to get out. Piper Parabo plays the character. She's a well known actress. I can't imagine that she's only there for that. Wonderful though it is, uh, oh, I can't believe she's not there for just that one seat. You know, true, exactly. Yeah. Though that was my thing was like, what, what, what was Essen? Mm-hmm. Because I know there was some things around World War One and Essen, um, but I don't know how they would interact with this. But I also don't want to say anything just yet, just in case I'm right. <laughs> but let's wait and see. Um, yes, but anyway. So uh, wrapping it up, you, is there anything else you think around how Magda will? kind of take our revenge over the coming episodes? I think I think this is our first big moment where we're seeing all those little pieces that she has, her actually manipulating those pieces in the way and her getting her little revenge on some of the people that may have uh, not followed her guidance in the past, I suppose. Yeah. But also, we should mention it here as well, just Santa Muerta as well being the bookend to the episode in a way, um, opening the episode, being there at, at the deaths at the hands of Mr. Schiff, and then claiming her soul at the end of the episode as Mr. Schiff is killed for what he did to the innocents um, that were killed in that moment. Everything was found out, the plan was found out, and he was stopped. You wonder whether that's something that Santa Marta did get involved in to claim the soul of somebody that killed an innocent. You know, the, why would the, that scene be there at the beginning of the episode where she's there, where she's connecting with the innocent child? Why would it be there? And why would we have the comeuppance to Mr. Schiff at the end of the episode? If it wasn't something connected to the, that overarching story of what is Santa Morsa willing to do um, to protect humans and to protect the living? Because um, there is a, that open question. She says she doesn't care. She says she's not supposed to. That's not her way. She's supposed to care for the souls. But, well, that's a question posed, right? She's definitely not going to stand out of it for the whole series because then you wouldn't have an arc of her character. So, uh, so yeah. could this be an indication that she is actually stepping in in some senses to protect uh, some of the people that shouldn't be killed. Yeah, I, I get the feeling that what we're going to see is Magda is a very much direct, she she directly involves herself to prod the story where she wants, yes. to prod the human where she wants. Just prod, little I whisper here we'll, and there. Yeah. 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 I think what we'll find is that Santa Muerte is potentially involved, though she just is not direct. Like, it's like, a softer touch, mm. uh, the touch of an angel just guiding, uh, but in a good whisper, if you will, mm. the whisper on the wind. Um, I'd be interested to see Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, where it goes. That's pretty much my point. Uh, anything else that you guys had on, on Magda and the revenge that she's been taking? Um, I just, it was more on Frank, um, I think, and his scary story. I think for me, there were two elements that I really liked about this. One, that it kind of did throw me back to those scary stories as a kid where someone would do a ghost story and then someone would do a real-life story, mm-hmm. which would freak you out even more. Um, so that I thought was really good. And just the way Frank delivers it in this kind of creepy way, uh, and certainly when he just shuts off the, the torch 
uh, right at the end of it. Yeah. Um, I thought was really nicely and how that developed with then further going after Tom, uh, through, uh, his, his, um, his morphing into Florence more. But, uh, it also felt like was this Frank, aka Florence, aka Elsa, aka Magda actually kind of delivering a warning because i love how he says how it happened in pasadena close to your house Mm -hmm. tom and he really is this a warning to the crafts that you know don't get in the way in a sense or are we going to see that tom trevor or linda are going to be embroiled in something like this and that there will be a kidnapping and for whatever reason uh, I, I don't know. It felt like it was a warning yeah, shot yeah. from Frank. Um, and whether the kids in the room, Trevor and Tom, actually understood it as that, who knows? But it was just when he said, well, it happened in Pasadena, um, just a couple of blocks away from your house. Yeah. Um, it's it's like, like directly a town when yeah, he says that too. Kind of making the point that scary stuff can happen here in Pasadena mm-hmm. uh, and it yeah. will be real. Uh, I thought that was just really, uh, really nicely done. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, and you're also completely correct. That is absolutely how those stories go. When you're a kid, uh, you tell a scary story about a zombie or a mummy or a witch or something. And then suddenly somebody goes, Oh, did you hear about what happened just down the street <laughs> yeah. from your house? Just down the road from your house, this murder happened or this thing happened. It's always something closer to home as well. So uh, it's a nice connection there as well. Um, any other notes about the episode? Uh, Nota de las Muertas, any notes of the dead? No notes for me. Just want to reiterate how tough of a scene that was at the fence with Josephine mm-hmm. like, just to, to watch. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, just to get... yeah, really, really tough. Really, really tough. Uh, one, one that I just want to mention, I know you mentioned the actor... Brad Garrett, uh, Chris, just in case anybody else didn't recognize him, he's probably best known from Everybody Loves Raymond, uh, the sitcom. Um, I'm using air quotes in that. That's uh, not <laughs> my type of uh, my, my type of sitcom. I'm right um, there with you. That's I I know he's yeah. in it. I just never watched. Everybody Loves Raymond. He's he's never Raymond's just, brother, no. and he uh, he was in every episode of the show. So uh, that went on for about fifty five years, I think. Um, if my I think it's closer to one hundred and thirty. Okay. Just, or at least it feels that so, just really interesting especially having him paired up with Nathan Lane both known as comedic actors and seeing them both in uh, very serious roles uh, in this episode even though we have a little bit of comedy between the two of them there is a nice comedic moment uh, between the two of them in, in this episode but uh, but really interesting to see comedic actors being cast in these yeah. very serious roles in here uh, mentioned about Mayor Lansky being uh, the mob's accountant as well um, but one thing just about the song that is sung by at the German Bund the, at Dr. Kraft's house that song is Ein Heller und ein Batzen uh, The Penny and the Dime interesting the good. penny for penny yeah, yeah. dreadful um, it's a popular German folk song from the 1800s a uh, regular fixture of, uh, of beer halls uh, in, across Germany but did become very well known as a marching song for German soldiers during World War II so uh, yeah. it's a nice little bit of foreshadowing there that these this group of the German Bund would be singing would choose this particular song led by Elsa and that would eventually go on to become a marching song for German soldiers in World War II Oh my God! Do you imagine she's going to introduce later on Magda as Elsa will bring in? And this is my friend Adolf, <laughs> and we find out that she's been whispering to Adolf. Maybe. <laughs> oh, exactly. be cool. I don't think he it's a nice little side, but probably not. <laughs> John, any notes from your side? Yeah, not nothing from my side uh, at all. Okay, so gentlemen, then I believe it's time we wrap up this episode. So, because John. He who speaks last speaks first. Uh, what did you think of this episode of Penny Dreadful Season 1, Episode 4, City of Angels, Josephina and the Holy Spirit? I thought this episode was really, really good. It had a massive feel of momentum. Um, I think it was challenging across a whole range of things. Um, and I loved how Magda was inserted in, in all of this. Um, and how bad things were starting to come about um uh you know th- this this revenge as you were saying derek uh, and so for me this is absolutely four and a half yards out of five um yeah we are, uh, indeed and uh i think it was just really good you know the interrelationships here are really 
start, some some new ones are beginning to emerge, but I think in particular um, around Matteo, uh, Josefina, and um, Officer Riley for me. Um, that I think it was amazing. The, those interrelationships so so challenging, really brutal, um, and what it kind of brings about in terms of what it kicks off is phenomenal. I think um, that was just done so, so well. Um, I loved Linda Craft as well um, Mm -hmm. at her party, you know, Mother Bee uh, walking around and she will sting. My goodness, (laughs) she will sting. And then with, with Benny Berman, what a, a great introduction to a character um, and having uh, Michener, you know, he's desperate enough to need the mob uh, as a, a detective. Mm-hmm. Yet, uh, I think, you know, he, he comes out of it with some of his integrity very much I- intact. And I think that's what I love about Penny Dreadful. I think things are written, they're not just bad or good. Um, they are absolutely somewhere in between and in fact they can they can move all over the place over the course of a season people can be uh bad they can disappoint they can be good they can come back down to earth um and it, it's it's really nicely fluid like i think real life is and it's challenging mm-hmm. in terms of what happens to josefina from riley but also um matteo doing his first kill Brutal, bloody, hands in. Um, really, what I love about Penny Dreadful, uh, and it's it's really good seeing it on City of Angels. So yeah, four and a half yards out of five. Excellent, oh, wunderbar. Yeah, wunderbar, uh, wunderbar. Uh, Derek, over to yourself. What did you think of this episode, Josephine and the Holy Spirit? I really, really enjoyed this episode. Apart from that moment where the German Bund were talking, were standing around uh, that section together and talking back and forth, all American and English actors. And I knew the minute I saw Chris would be attempting his German accent <laughs> all episode this week. And I, yeah. I couldn't stop. I was like, oh, no, please don't. And then they had a sing song. And I was like, Chris is going to attempt that on the podcast as well. <laughs> so you were on my mind when I was watching this episode, Chris. Thank you. I'm all, I should be always on your mind, especially <laughs> when there is terrible accents. You are. When there are terrible accents at play, Chris is <laughs> we, we have been spurred the singing. Let's, we have. Let's be... Let's be thankful. Let's be honest. But the good news is the acting, the writing in this episode and the storyline really uh, got me off that pretty quickly. Uh, I thought there was some of the best moments in this, uh, in the season so far in this episode. Everything from how scary the, uh, the night tale was from Frank. Mm. You know, if you were eight or nine years old and you heard that story or six or seven years old and heard that story and then turned over in your bed at night and saw the personification of the character you just heard about, (laughs) I think you'd be terrified for life, you know? You'd certainly be wet in the bed pretty quickly. Uh, I think you'd be terrified for life at that moment, you know? It's a life-changing experience. But that plus the gruesomeness of uh, Riley's murder, plus the the difficulty in watching the scene with Josefina and and uh, Riley as well, you know, there's so many really good scenes, a really good show. I have to say I'm, I'm excited for what we're going to see. I'm only four episodes into this show. We've got six more episodes to go. So uh, nowhere near its heights just yet, as far as I can see. But it's ramping up every week. So definitely one of my, uh, definitely very happy to be covering this one. Chris, what do you think overall? Uh, they good. Yeah. Uh, wunderbar and everything else in between. I'll save you my <laughs> terrible German accent. Um, again, if anyone has access, hello, hello, just from the old seventies. <laughs> it's so good. BBC comedy. If you want British humor, it's, that's okay. it. And what? that's where my accents, German and French. Do not listen to from. a word he's saying, no. fellow, fellow dreadful people <laughs> yes and that is my terrible german accent that is the end of it i swear uh no to to talk about this episode really it, it was a tough one uh at certain parts and i was probably more down on parts of it last episode than as i come in so it, it's kind of like i i'm finding that there are highs and lows to this ep- each episode mm-hmm. and the highs for the season are outperforming the lows and they're not terrible lows. They're just for me, potentially 
oh, I wish they had done it this way. I'm not the writer. I'm not the director. I should sit back more. And I think that's what I'm starting to do now, which is, no, no, no. This is their, this is their run. This is, this was written by John Logan. And this is, I, and I should respect what he, the story he wants to tell at the pace he wants to tell it because previous knowledge dictates he's good at what he does and he's going to tell a good story as how he does it. Um, so I, yeah, I've now accepted that and I'm sitting back and, um, sitting with my beer Stein and in my gazebo <laughs> singing some German Stein hall songs. Excellent. I think it's Stein hall songs. Beer hall. Mm. Yeah. Beer hall. <laughs> beer hall. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, I, I know I know we've been saying that as well, John Logan will tell his story at his pace, but I don't think I was expecting an episode that was crammed with as much as this episode, uh this quickly, I suppose. It, it felt like so much was going on here um as well for me. So uh, really good, really good. Let's get on to our feedback section. Penny for your thoughts. If you have any thoughts on the podcast or on uh Penny Dreadful City of Angels, email them to us at feedback at TV podcast industries dot com or come join us over on our Facebook group at Facebook. Facebook.com slash groups slash TV podcast industries. Or why not go over to us on Twitter at TV pod industries. Uh, been live tweeting the episodes uh, each week, but with the weirdness of the release for Penny Dreadful City of Angels, I'm not too sure whether um, I'm going to be live tweeting it in future. They released the episode on Showtime.com first thing, I think almost 24 hours before it goes on air, which I think is really weird to do. And then when it goes live, most people have already seen the episode, so and it's also not at a very it, so it's not it's like Netflix where it goes specifically at like nine a.m. Mm. or nine p.m. or twelve. There's like we have a launch window because it hasn't gone exactly at yeah. a specific time each time. Well, I think what seems to have happened is it goes live on on the channel at, at ten p.m. and I think they said to their tech guys, okay, at one minute past midnight on Sunday night. You need to release the episode on our on-demand platform so that people who've watched the episode on TV can then watch it on demand. I think what happened is the tech team went, they said one minute past midnight on Sunday. Do they mean Sunday 12.01 a.m. or do they mean Monday 12.01 a.m.? And I think they've just coded it wrong. So I think that's all that's happened. It suddenly gets released and then sometime in the middle of the day they go, it's out right now. But it's always been out for four or five hours yeah. before they do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just keep every time they go, it's out right now. That's when I think they're releasing nope. it, and I'm like, or like that hour, and I'm like, it's just a weird, like, because that's that that tweet has always been at a very different yeah. time, and I'm like, cool. and it's hours this after people like, are already talking about the episode. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, <laughs> but there you go. So it may not be live tweeting again, but if I am, follow us over on the on TV Pod Industries uh, over at Twitter. Yes. First up, we have an email from James Picanisco, who emailed us again with his Pasadena connections uh, based on last week's episode, episode three. He had this to say. Thanks for reading my notes, guys. No special nuggets this week other than say I love this episode. The dance scenes were fantastic. Nathan Lane kicking the out of the kid was a little cathartic <laughs> to my self-quarantined mind for some reason and he really pulled off being tough <laughs> the santa monica pier does have a ferris wheel and a roller coaster but the close-up shots of tiago and molly on the pier were actually shot about 15 miles south at the redondo beach pier and that big white building shown from outside that the councilman exercises in is actually city hall of los angeles dedicated in 1928 really love the podcast thanks so much one final mention high school musical for the dancing with demons <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim, for writing into us. And yes, High School Musical 4, Dancing with Demons. I love it. It is peak perfection. I enjoy. Yes. Thank you, Jim, for bringing High School Musical back uh, to Chris. So <laughs> we will have un the unholy trinity of High School Musical, German accents, and off-key singing oh from now God. on. This is imagine? our own Penny Dreadful. Oh, absolutely. We're, I'm in my nightmare. <laughs> We're out of and we'll probably we'll probably record it live as well, so I can't even edit it just <laughs> to be in my real nightmares. <laughs> if anyone wants to write a screenplay for a high school musical oh, four <laughs> dancing with German demons, I will so <laughs> oh, do no. that. I will read your script 
just for the crack, because I could be Zach Efron, <laughs> who all face painted red, dancing in a German accent. It would be oh, wunderbar. Wow. <laughs> oh no oh no thanks very much for that jim yeah uh, thanks so much jim <laughs> <laughs> our next piece of feedback comes from former co-host of this podcast ray <laughs> you might be asked back ray um <laughs> yes <laughs> He is also the host of the Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast, and he has some thoughts about episode three over in our Facebook group. He says, I've just caught up with episode two and three, and wow, what a, t- a joy to jump back into the City of Angels. First off, I loved the dance routine between Matteo and Rio, yet another character by Natalie Dormer. Not usually into dance numbers, but the classic style and the energy was intoxicating. Molly and Tiago were a great development, and how cruel is Molly's mother taunting her with Popeye's theme? Incredible. Nathan Lane as Lewis is just down right remarkable and i find myself hanging on his every word his old school sensibility is just so charming finally the unintentionally funny moment for me was seeing molly's bodyguard trail both her and tiago with a stick of fairy floss in hand hoping i can watch the subsequent ep- episodes promptly in order to give timely feedback keep up the good work guys fairy floss in australia yeah we call it candy floss over here yeah candy floss yeah, i think it's candy floss in america as well but fairy floss that makes sense i literally didn't cop Candy Floss Fairy Floss. Okay, makes more sense now. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. thanks, uh, Ronaldo. Um, I think, uh, yeah, Nathan Lane's been uh, really, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think, as Jim mentioned, you know, this, if you've not seen him on Broadway doing serious stuff, mm-hmm. I suppose this is many people's first kind of um, uh, sort of exposure. And he is. He, he just has a great old school sensibility, as you say. Yeah. Um, I, I, lo- I love... What he's doing, I think, as well in this episode with uh, Benny Berman, it's just really pitched absolutely perfectly by Nathan Lane, uh, for sure. Yeah. And Mr. Lane, if you want to come on our podcast, obviously, we know you're at home in New York at this point in time doing nothing in quarantine. Actually, not just Mr. Lane. If any of the actors of Penny Dreadful, if you know them and you want to get them just to come on down and give us a quick interview, sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, uh, Ronaldo, um, for sure. It, it's really great to get your thoughts on City of Angels. And yeah, hopefully that would be pretty awesome if we got uh, Nathan Lane uh, onto the podcast for a, a little interviewee um, element here. I think that would be pretty cool. So, uh, Chris, prepare the email. Um, we also have a voicemail. And just a quick reminder for everyone, if you want to hear your voice on the podcast, your dulcet tones, as it were, in, in the same way, uh, I believe there were some dulcet tones on episode three of City of Angels. You can record a clip of yourself on your phone and email it to us, or you can go to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com and record 90 seconds of your thoughts uh, about the week's episode. We'd love to hear from everyone, uh, but we do have uh, our regular reoccurring voicemail guest in Steve Brown. Uh, It's great to get your voicemail in, Steve. Uh, Let's give it a listen. Hey guys, it's Steve. Uh, This is for episode four, Josefina and, is it episode four? Yeah. Josefina and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Wow. This uh, episode was really, really good. And I I don't know if I'm going to get a chance to watch it again before you guys record. So that's why I'm sending this out uh, on Sunday night. But uh, wow, man, I am just there's just there was so much stuff in this in this one that surprised me, and so I, I want to pick three moments uh, off the top of my head that I really thought were really really good. We've been looking forward to Riley kind of getting his comeuppance, but uh, wow, that was brutal. That was graphic. Uh, I did not expect that Mateo that that level of psychopathy. Uh, from him. And, uh, then of course we see the uh, Natalie, <laughs> Natalie Dormer, the, uh, Elsa scene with, with Peter Kraft in his house. And, uh, that was just, uh, it was kind of heartbreaking on one hand, but we knew it was coming that he was going to, uh, they were going to have that, that uh, moment, that tryst. And, uh, I loved her meeting with the wife and the wife saying that she wouldn't be, the other woman or however uh, 
Piper Perabu, uh, said it and, uh, uh, just, yeah, so many good, so much good stuff, uh, in this episode. It's hard to pick just three, but I will, uh, uh pick just a third one, which is I'm really, really glad that we see Tiago and Molly there at the end washing dishes together, seemingly like they're kind of back together. Like he's kind of accepted the fact that, that she's flawed, that she's not evil. She's just flawed. Uh, and uh, that makes her a great character. So uh, I can't wait to hear your guys' discussion of this, this episode because there was so much in it. And uh, I can't wait to hear what you guys thought. Uh, talk to you later. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, Steve also added, I totally forgot in my voicemail to mention the shoulder block that Elsa gives to Kraft's wife, <laughs> perfectly played by Natalie Dormer and Piper Parabo. Uh, yeah, really good. I, I didn't think it was so much a, a shoulder block. I actually thought Piper Parado or Linda Kraft, I actually think she did do, um, you know, that NFL shoulder oh, barge yeah. uh, on her. So, um, but yeah, Elsa certainly stood up. Um, I think Piper Parabo, yeah, that what a great role. Um, as I say, Queen Bee and Stings. Yeah, um, good. although probably, uh, Natalie Dormer will sting her back even worse. Oh, um, and really good to hear from you, Steve. And definitely, if this is a wow episode. There are so many moments here that make you pause for thought, think about what's possible coming up, shock you, challenge you, um, make you kind of go a little gooey inside. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, it, it's really good. By gooey inside, I meant Tiago and Molly at the end, where it's like, ah, oh. uh, and then there's like the holding on for dear life as uh, Mateo is, yeah, psychoing it to right. the max, and yeah, you're kind of Elsa and, and Peter going, uh, if only Linda could see you now, she would crucify you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so from one gooey moment to the other, let's move on to something less gooey and more liquid. I do believe it's time to go to the old beer hall and down to Penny Dreadful Pokers. Yeah, welcome, fellow Dreadfuls, to the Penny Dreadful Dreadful Pub Quiz. <laughs> um, grab a Steiner of beer and, of course, head on over to the Crimson Cat winking for this week's uh, pub quiz, <laughs> dare I say it. Um, remember, you can send in your answer to this episode episode four's question uh by email to feedback at tv podcast industries.com and of course we will have um some penny dreadful goodies uh for the winner mm -hmm. of the pub quiz remember a uh, point per question unless otherwise stated uh by myself <laughs> of course so the question for episode four josephine and the holy spirit just between us girls, what drink does Linda Craft quaff during her son's birthday party? Excellent. And, you know, we have now got a reputation of asking a question and then it being fully laid out in the next episode. So <laughs> so uh, this may be fully laid out next episode. John, give us the question one more time. Well, Penny Dreadfuls, just between us girls... What drink does Linda Craft quaff during her son's birthday party? Mm -hmm. yes. And if you've been listening to our podcast for a fair few of our episodes, you will know that I have said that this is one of my favorite cocktails. There you go. Mm. Nice hint, Chris. Nice Thanks. hint. Yes, good hint. Thanks so much for the pub quiz question, John. Uh, hopefully we'll get, some, get loads of uh, entries for this one for the Penny Dreadful pub quiz. Exactly. Whether Linda was quaffing it to sort of dull the sound of kids or whether she was um, just doing it to dull the sound of singing Nazis uh, in her back garden. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, or maybe the local gossip from the Pasadena area. But certainly um, she does like this drink a lot. Definitely. I do love that moment as uh, as Elsa arrives with Frank and goes to Dr. Kraft. I need to meet your wife. And he just has this look where he can hear just does this look where he looks around the entire area going, I have no idea where that woman is. I, mean, I just don't know. <laughs> she uh, is really at good. the bar. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us, fellow Betty Faithful. Thanks. It's been really good having you on board for this season. Please stay in contact with us and send us your feedback uh, as you go through the episode. Hope you stay subscribed to the podcast. If you enjoy what you hear, why not share it with your friends or leave us a review 
review over on iTunes. Uh, you can leave us a five star review and your thoughts about uh, what we're doing right, hopefully, or email us and tell us what we're doing wrong. Uh, <laughs> we might change it in the future. Yes, we've done <laughs> nothing wrong, have we? Have we? <laughs> And as I mentioned before, you can also join us over on Patreon if you want to hear our thoughts about Captain America Winter Soldier. We should be releasing that over the next couple of weeks as well. We'll be back next week with Penny Dreadful City of Angels, Episode 5, Children of the Royal Sun, which comes out on May 24th. Yes, thank you so much. And I will end by saying, I'll be saying goodbye. I know, I can't remember. the Was it goodbye? So, so what you can't remember the tune or lyrics to a song, Chris? <laughs> to you and you and you and you and you. Uh, oh yeah, goodbye. Oh my goodness, I think my eardrums have just blown. <laughs> or you have just smashed a glass, as I said you would, and just gouged them out. Either way, you <laughs> we're just staying in goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, fellow dreadfuls, it's a pleasure speaking with you and indeed maybe even sharing in your pain at such musical renditions that Chris uh uh will provide on the Dreadful Podcast. But remember, keep high doing, keep high doing, and above all else, keep high dying. <laughs> nice. Bye. Bye. Bye.